James Edmund Burnett Jr. Can you spell it? J A M E S E D M O N D B U R N E T T Jr. And how old are you? Ah, 52. Okay. Now, where do you live currently? Uh, currently, Monette. Uh, have you, have you ever lived here, like, in Shannon County? Or are you just visiting? Uh, no, uh, our family's been down here since my great-grandfather, Edmund Burnett, which is where I get my middle name. So, uh, the, the family, the old homestead out on F Highway has been on our family for four generations. So, I've been back and forth down here since just a little kid. Always loved it. So. And why is that? Why do you love this area so much? Uh, the beauty, and it seems like home. Even though I didn't grow up here, it still seems there's an attachment, an emotional attachment. Uh, the beauty of the place is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Peaceful. Uh, and, you know, it's nice, uh, it's nice to get, escape the world, you yeah. so this is, uh, to me it's a retreat, uh, you know, being in the Marine Corps and then uh, seeing all the nasty in the world, sometimes you just need to escape and have a quiet place and uh, thank God this is here. Really, it's been a lifesaver. It really has. Oh, wow. Um, I was born in Monet. Uh, my father was a career highway patrol. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mother, which, thank God for that. Best thing in the world. Probably the hardest job in the world is being a stay-at-home mom. But there was nothing better as a kid when you come home from school and mom's there. Yeah, so, uh, I had a next door, uh, I had a next door neighbor named John that was like, uh, he was like an older brother to me. Always, well, I couldn't think of him as anything less than a brother. Uh, he was the one that joined me, uh, got me to join the Marine Corps. He joined the Marine Corps. Uh, even though my dad was a highway patrolman, uh, John was ornery. So I got to experience both sides of that as a kid growing up. Uh, he passed away. Um, and then I got married. And then back in 2017, my wife passed away from brain cancer. Four months after that, my baby brother committed suicide. Uh, combined with uh, the losses of friends in the Marine Corps, I just hit the self-destruct button at that point in time. Um, And then uh, after that, uh, I just gave up. I gave up. Um, I think when I left Missouri, I was about a. Well, I went from about 205 pounds down to 130. Um, I went to I went to the VA hospital, and of course their answer to everything was a pill. And I was so self-destructive at that point; I'd just given up. Um, So I was taking the pills and then uh, I just shut myself in the house and about by 9 a.m. in the morning I would have my I would have my first drink and I'd usually go through about a fifth and a 
a pint of alcohol by about five o'clock in the afternoon. I was so numb that I'd just pass out. That's how I was dealing with the pain. Uh, and then all the prior PTSD issues. Uh, I just found myself falling into a deeper and deeper and deeper dark hole. Um, and then it got to the point when it was like the pills, the alcohol, that wasn't good enough. And then, uh, you know, it went from that to the pills to the alcohol and then I uh, found myself out on the street looking for any other type of drug. Um, in this just big abandoned like farm like a hay field uh, you know I'd taken a bunch of pills and drank smoked a bunch of cannabis and the last thing I remember was smoking crack out of a light bulb you know one thing that I never you know I was raised better I was raised in a family of law enforcement, you know, military. One thing I never thought I would do, and you know, I did it because, you know, like I said, I'd run up and hit that self-destruct button and nothing was going to stop me at that point, nothing. Uh, and I remember getting back home and going into my bedroom and my whole body just started to sweat and I, immediately I knew that I had od uh, got really nauseous sick and I convinced myself you know to get in go to the bathroom you're gonna get sick and when I rolled off the bed I I collapsed you know I was so lightheaded and there's like a little rug right by the bed and I was trying to convince myself you know if you roll over and get on your hands and knees I was like Maureen you can do a push-up just get yourself up and get to the bathroom. I got about halfway up and then collapsed and then just went into this little fetal position. And my last thought was like, well, congratulations, you know, you finally, you know, you did what you set out to do and now your mom's lost her only other son. Uh, woke up the next morning and I was just curled up in a little ball just laying there in my own filth. I mean, took a shower and went over to my mom and dad's and I just sat down in the kitchen and I just broke, you know. You know, everybody always wonders, you know, what their breaking point is. You know, you'll have all these tough guys running around, I don't have, I'll never break, I'll never break. Yeah, you will. I guarantee you, you will. Everybody has that point. I found mine. And I was just crying. I was sobbing. You know, confessing to my mom and dad what I had done. You know, and, uh, and my mother just, I remember she got angry, which wasn't what I was expecting, wasn't what I was expecting from my mom. But she was angry and she started crying and she told me, she was like, if you stay here, if you stay here, you are going to die if you stay here. And she was right. You know, she was right. And then uh, I had an older sister that lived out in Colorado and she was a police officer. Um, she would got a hold of me and she was like, why don't you come out here for a couple weeks? and see how you like it, 
And I was like, I was like, okay. And I got out there, you know, and I liked it. So uh, I went back, you know, packed up a few things, and then right back out to Colorado I went. And then uh, she let me stay with her for about three months. And then she got me set up in an apartment. There was a... Uh, there was a recovery. It was called Recovery United or Recovery Unanimous. It was like a church faith-based recovery program. And I remember getting into that with her help. And I was I was the guy sitting in the very, very back with that sour look on my face saying, you know what? You know, I think of God as a deadbeat dad, absentee father, I was done. I was like, you know what, if this is the way it is, I want no part of what you're trying to sell. Um, um, and then after about two years, you know, things, things finally started to change. Uh, and then when my apartment lease ended, I just called my dad and said, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm ready to come back home. So I got back here and then dad was, uh, he was doing a lot of work trying to restore the old homestead. And uh, so I jumped on board and started coming down here and, uh, and helping him with that. Uh, And then I finally brought up the point. I was like, well, do you care if I just, you know, move down here? I was like, and stay here? And he was like, yeah. And this is a, this is a godsend. Uh, you know, without this place down here, you know, you would have found me in a ditch. You know, or wrapped around a telephone pole. Or just laying dead in the floor inside the house. You know, that's where everything was headed at that point. Uh, and then I got lots of family, you know, the lumber coming the Spurgeons over here, their cousins, and, you know, and, you know, they've been fantastic. I can't say enough good, you know, about them, about family down here. I mean, the community, period, everybody. I mean, you drive by, you know, you get a nice wave, a smile. Everybody's always got a minute of their time to just stop and, and talk if you have a question. Uh, I found peace. I found peace. What would you say is the best thing overall about living here? I don't think you can really narrow it down to one. I don't. You know? It's like this whole ball of awesomeness. <laughs> You know, and you can't just pick out one thing. Uh, it's, you know, nature, the rivers, wildlife, people, community, uh, love. You know, the one thing that I give up on that I never thought I'd find again. You know, uh, it gave me belief that that still exists, and uh, hope. Yeah. You know? Now, on the flip side, now, what do you think is the hardest thing about living here? Oh my God, the horse flies. <laughs> Describe a horse fly to somebody who doesn't know what a horse fly. Oh. A horse fly will not take no for an answer. Think of uh, something that's like the size of a dragonfly, as mean as a badger, uh, as aggressive as a snake, and if it bites you, you're going to remember it your entire lifetime. You'll never forget it. Uh, pesky, they won't leave you alone. If they decide that you're a target, forget about it. Run, run. <laughs> now, do you think that people from this area are unique? 
from other people in the country? Oh no, I think we're all unique. You know, I think uh, I think this part of the country is unique compared to other parts of the country. Um, what represents the Ozarks? I guess then that makes it unique. What represents the Ozarks? <sighs> Perseverance. pioneer spirit that has not wavered since the very beginning. Can you give me an example of that? An example of the pioneer spirit? An ironclad will to, to persevere and achieve something greater than yourself. The Marine Corps was really good about mm -hmm. instilling the idea of living your life to a higher standard. You know, and that has really carried over with me uh, down here, at least. I don't know if that really answered your question or not. Could you rephrase it for me a little bit differently? Well, I'm thinking that what is like, is there like a story of like how you came to be like you said that like, you're rebuilding this homestead. I feel like that's a pretty good story of like perseverance. It's something that was old. It's like yeah. you and your family are like working to like. Yeah. You know, well, um, when I was a little child, when we would uh, when we'd come down here and visit my grandfather Leonard, uh, everybody down here called him Braun. You know, and my grandfather was just the world to me. I mean, I looked at him, he was, he was my American idol, you know, he, he was it. Just huge, huge guy, you know, he's like 6'4", and I mean, the stories that other people just tell me <clears throat> about him, I find just absolutely unbelievable, you know. Uh, um, you know, he was, <clears throat> he was in World War II. Um, I remember in the in the homestead out there, he had this old, uh, and he was a great cook. Man, this man was a great cook. He had this old wood burning cook stove that he would always cook on, and I, I remember the old wood burning cook stove and uh, the outhouse. There was no indoor plumbing, so they, there was an outhouse. And as a kid, you thought going out to the outhouse was like walking. <laughs> two miles to get to the outhouse. Um, I remember that, especially in the winter time, you didn't want to go outside at night, especially in the winter time, to find the outhouse. Uh, let me see. Uh, and then my, uh, my great grandfather, Edmund, uh, was the one that built the homestead. And uh, you know, my grandfather was born there. My dad was born there in the homestead. Um, and you know it's my family history and I intend to honor that with a hundred percent of my being I mean believe it or not when I'm out there I this might seem strange but I feel they're with me I feel that uh, I feel that they're looking after me. Uh, I feel protected from my own thoughts, really. You know, uh, sometimes I can get. You know how you can get in your head too much. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't have that out there. I. I have a sense of peace. You know, It's almost spiritual, I guess. Yeah. 
Uh, well, right now, uh, the immediate future holds a refrigerator Tuesday. <laughs> so, what about the future of the area in general, do you think? Of the homestead? Well, I know we're surrounded by Mark Twain, so it really doesn't have a lot of growth possibility, but that's what I like. That's what I like. I don't want to see it commercialized, you know. Uh, I don't really want to see a lot of these, like, cookie-cutter subdivisions where every third house, it looks the same. It's individualism. Rustic individualism down here is so prominent to me versus other parts of the country that I've seen. Uh, it's an Ozarkian spirit, you know, that you don't find anywhere else in the country, nowhere else. It's unique, unique. And sheer determination, sheer will to carve out your own, your own life. I mean, you, you come down here, it's an open book. The pages are blank and you can rewrite your own story. Um, I'm going to rewrite my own family story. And after I get the homestead finished, me and my father, uh, it'll probably become a guest cabin for other family members. And then uh, I'll probably build, you know, I'll probably build. And I'll probably live the rest of my life here. I've already got like a little family plot out at Munsell Cemetery where most of my family's at. And so I got my piece of ground picked out. Anything else? Is there anything that you just want people to know about you or about the area? Uh, about me. I wouldn't call myself a role model. Yeah. I wouldn't call myself a role model. I wouldn't call myself a war hero. I wouldn't. Guard. Uh, some scars never heal. Some scars run so deep there's no escaping. Sometimes I have a lot of problems with like thunderstorms, that loud boom, you know, and the flash of light really, you know. I'm not going to say scared, I'm not going to say frightened, but it's like a flash of memory when that happens. Middle East. Yeah. I really don't like to, you know, no, get into that. No, I just wanted to make sure that that was Yeah. Way. So, all right. All right, that's all the questions that I have. Okay. Thank you so much for yeah. sitting down and talking with us. Oh, oh my goodness. You have a wonderful story.